Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the High Commission of India, the India House. Today, we are gathered here to have an interesting and interactive conversation uh, along with our eminent panelists on a topic which is topical as well as very interesting in the sense that artificial intelligence, it's as important, also it's evolving. Because as far as I know, there isn't in even a widely accepted definition of what is artificial intelligence, exactly what constitutes artificial intelligence, whether machine learning is part of it or it's just the basis of it. So there are just a lot of theories floating around, like what exactly constitutes it and how to regulate it more importantly and what it means for the whole technological sector because AI is growing at a pace that nobody still understands. And given the already very vibrant tech ecosystem in India and UK, we thought it would be a good idea to have a conversation on what are the synergies in this evolving sector that can be identified and pursued between both countries, which are already collaborating in a wide array of fields. With that, I would also like to put my appreciation first to Technoplat and Shubash, without whom this event would not have been possible. Thanks, Shubash. And I would now request High Commissioner Sir to kindly address the audience, after which we'll be hearing the panelists as well. Thank you, Sri Ranjini. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. Um, seems that this is really a very well-timed event. Uh, earlier today, the Tony Blair Institute did an event on technology at which um, Mr. Blair himself, of course, spoke, and we had uh, Demis Hassabis of Google DeepMind and a range of other in interesting people participate. But for me, the, uh, the special element of it was the fact that they had specifically invited uh, former Minister of State for IT and uh, Communications and te Telecom, uh, Mr. Rajiv Chandrasekhar, to come and talk about how technology was helping disrupt and create new models for governance and to enable countries to leapfrog in the development space. And I thought, you know, it was amazingly fortuitous that um, we had organized this event on the same day. It turned out that the TBI was equally uh, thinking that it was a fortuitous event, not because of us, of course, but because uh, they hadn't anticipated that they would have organized this event four days after an election in the UK. They thought this, this would segue on to the election. So in a sense, you never know when things are timely. Uh, what is not timely, however, is the fact that I'm speaking before the panel and not after it, because frankly, whatever knowledge there is to be gained from this event isn't going to come from me. It's going to come from the panelists here. But I did have a few thoughts to offer you, uh, not on the subject of uh, artificial intelligence, but the larger idea of how, from a public uh, policy practitioner's perspective, we have started seeing technology in India. And I think maybe that's an important way in which we can link up these two worlds. Admittedly, technology brings with it challenges. Historically, technologies, technology has... Um, been seen as an enabler. But technology historically was always something that was shared naturally. It wasn't, in other words, something that was rationed out at a cost. That, you know, think about this for a moment. When paper was invented, when uh, gunpowder was invented, when the iron stirrup was invented, nobody said, come to a patent office in Mongolia to come and register this, right? You actually used the technology because it was there and it was empowering and how you got better was the way in which you used the technology, not in the technology itself. But today, new added lemon flavor uh, medical products can be patented again. And that to me suggests that technology from this developmental perspective, somewhere along the way we're beginning to lose the plot. Second thing I wanted to suggest to you is that if you really want to be able to leverage technology, you need to be able to look at it for what value it brings 
to every strata of society. Take, for instance, the idea of using biometrics as a means of enabling all forms of development. In India today, we are now using biometric-based banking. And I thought this is an absolutely fantastic idea because it is relevant not just in India, but including in the UK. Why is it relevant? It's relevant because, because biometrics is being leveraged in India to remove the necessity for banks to have to set up ATMs and bank points in remote rural areas and areas which are otherwise expensive to service. You, can, you don't have to have lived in this country too long to see why this is relevant, not just in an emerging market economy like India, but also in a developed uh, economy like the UK. Ultimately, if the service becomes so expensive that it is unviable to provide, then a, then a commercial service provider will take it away and not develop it. But if you use technology as a means of leapfrogging that particular hurdle, then any service provider could legitimately be, be utilized as a means of paying out but also receiving cash. So, in other words, technology enables you to reimagine what the possibilities of doing business are. Third, technology enables you to reimagine delivery of essential services and the integration of business services with, um, with public services. Take, for instance, the idea of healthcare, something that is current in every, every country, including this one, the question of how do you improve the quality of healthcare and deliver better quality healthcare. The UK has, by virtue of the long history of its NHS, a, a remarkable institution, which I believe, speaking as a foreigner, that I can see why the British would be so, so invested in what an important uh, institution this is in this country. But how do you actually make it better? You've got all of this great data that sits around everywhere. If you can integrate it and make that data available to your own scientists, you might actually be at the cusp of being able to come up with specific engineered medical products for specific healthcare needs that cater to particular genome types. And I think that, again, is the way in which you can build forward using public policy and using technology. You can also look at the process by which we have consistently tried to leverage technology to make the provision of government services qualitatively better. In India, with our space program, for instance, over the last 45, 50 years, we have leveraged space-based assets increasingly to provide a range of developmental opportunities. This doesn't just include the provision of uh, telemetry services or the provision of weather forecasting services. Today, it includes the capacity to identify fish stocks for fishermen. It includes the capacity to identify water for uh, farmers and for irrigation projects, uh, groundwater. It includes the capacity to help in spatial planning for infrastructure projects, reducing, therefore, the, cost, the high cost of ground-based truthing of surveys. Each of these things helps you essentially deliver better quality services. Fourth, the way in which you leverage technology to provide services helps you create fiscal space. By our own estimate, in the provision of services uh, and uh, essentially financial incentives to people who needed it in India, historically, uh, you will all, those of you who, who were in India in the 80s will remember no less than the Prime Minister of India at that point of time pointed out that 85%, 85 rupees in every 100, leached away because this, the, the distribution pipes effectively were, were corroded, uh, which is a polite way of saying people nicked the money. Uh, with technology, we have been able to provide literally hundreds of billions of dollars worth of um, services to people financially, directly to the, uh, to the, um, to the recipient, directly to their phones. What's not to like in a system that enables you to provide money directly, to open new bank accounts, to take banking in India from under 20% to over 80% of the population in around a decade, and effectively creates for you 45 to $50 billion worth of extra financial space. That money then can be spent on improving other services. So, in a sense, AI is at that wonderful sweet spot, like all technologies are, in driving better financial uh, planning, 
better administrative planning, better delivery of services, and cheaper services for businesses to offer to their customers. And that's just technology. When you add the AI overlay to it, the secret sauce for me is the speed at which all of this is going to converge around with AI. It isn't just about, you know, producing funky cat videos. It isn't just about getting clever responses done to routine emails. It is about taking away the A, the drudgery of certain tasks, but B, bringing together the enormous potential that data today offers us to be able to innovate new solutions at scale and at speed. And if people like Dennis Hasabis are able to show and prove that with the deployment of, you know, high quality AI solutions, you are now at the point where everything that we consider to be uniquely human capabilities can actually be replicated. Maybe not at the same level of generic intelligence, but at, at least at specified pillars of intelligence. Then we are really at the point where we should start figuring out how do we leverage this? And finally, how do we leverage this for countries like India and the UK to work together? And really, this is why our Tech Tuesday effort that the High Commission is trying to organize is centered around the idea of socializing the partnership between India and the UK in the tech space. Because this future can go in one of two ways. One, it can become, as I began, something where it encourages rent-seeking behavior or it encourages, for want of a better word, authoritarian states to, to leverage an advantage and you know, force us all to, 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 to sort of take on products that have a number of Trojans and backdoors that we don't know about. Or it can encourage us to do things at scale for, for human benefit in a way that business also benefits. I don't know about you, but I definitely prefer the latter opportunity, which is why we're here today. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, sir. Now, I'm happy to call upon Shubhash Ghosh, founder, Tech Tuesdays UK, to come and give an idea of what we are to expect in the panel and also introduce our panelists. It takes a lot to stand out here. Thank you. Um, good evening, the Honorable uh, High Commissioner, the Honorable Deputy High Commissioner, uh, Minister of Economic, members of the High Commission of India, panel members and guests. I'm Subhash Arghosh, and I'm the founder of Tech Tuesday UK, and I welcome to all of you to the special episode of Tech Tuesday Extra. Once again, thanks to the High Commissioner, the Deputy High Commissioner, for hosting us this evening. Before we start, a couple of do's and don'ts. There's only one door heading outside, which is right behind you. Once you head out, you have the washrooms on the left and the stairs on the right. Mobile phones at all times should be kept on silent mode. This is a restricted area. Photography is allowed only in this room. Tech is UK, which is part of Technoplat, an entity I had launched seven years ago, and I win it in the heart, uh, in 2017, as the official residence of the British High Commissioner of Singapore. I'm happy to be standing here today at the High Commission of India, UK, to present a special episode of Tech Tuesday Extra, focusing on the AI landscape in India and the UK. Moving on, for some of you, who were attending Tech Chooses UK for the very first time. This knowledge platform stemmed from the very idea of building a community that ideates, nurtures, and then fosters a free for discussion of disruptive technology, which have the potential to impact a billion lives. Tech Chooses UK is a monthly event, which takes place on the first Tuesday of every month, where we spend close to about 70 minutes, 90 odd minutes having conversations around technology. The most unique thing about Tech to the UK, as you realize, that this is a free for discussion where we do not have any moderation or any speakers or any given script or any, any set of given pre-decided questions. This is an interactive exchange of ideas, which makes the discussion a lot more interesting, engaging, and engrossing. If you've been following uh, Tech Tuesday UK, you will know that every episode of Tech Tuesday UK is based on a particular technology theme. And as you'd be, you'd be aware that 
for today evening, today's episode is on the topic AI landscape in India and the UK. And we have with us an amazing panel comprising of the following guests. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Dr. Chris Moore. Chris, let me say. Chris is a technology specialist and AI lead at UK Department of Business and Trade. We have Dr. Mike Short, CBE. Mike, please take your seat. Mike is the, was, is the former Chief Scientific Advisor at the DBT and currently an advisor at the Satellite Application Catapult of the UK. We have Gautam Hazari. Gautam. Gautam is the co-founder and CTO of Secura ID. And last but not the least, we have Sanat Rao. Sanat, please take your seat. Sanat is the former CEO of Infosys Finical and currently is a co-founder of Within the Box AI. Gentlemen, I now leave the floor open. All the best. Thank you. So good evening, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. As former Chief Scientific Advisor, I I'm really pleased to see uh, my former boss, uh, Sir Patrick Vallance, appointed as the new Science Minister in the, in the new UK government. Uh, I did five years as Chief Scientific Advisor in DBT, and I was also on the board of Innovate UK. I'm very happy to contribute my knowledge in this area. Uh, Hi everyone, my name is Sanat. Uh, after 34 years in industry, I've just become an entrepreneur. Uh, I've also got caught by the AI wave, but I don't have an AI background. Uh, we recently set up a research and advisory practice called Within the Box AI, and while everyone is fixated around the technology behind AI, our proposition at within the box.ai is that there's another very important element, which is the human being. And in the opening comments, you heard that there's no definition of AI. Fortunately, there's a definition of what human beings are, and that is what we want to leverage as part of our practice. So looking forward to a discussion today, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Good evening, everybody. My name is Chris Moore. I'm a technology specialist working for the Department for Business and Trade. In that role, I do two things. I help companies that are based overseas to come and set up their business in the UK. And I also help UK-based companies to export internationally. I am in the Science and Technology Directorate within DBT, and I lead on many of the activities associated with AI. So I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to talk to this audience this evening. Um, I should also add, prior to uh, this role, I worked in the private sector, uh, and uh, quite a long time ago, I was working on uh, activities around image recognition and identification, so AI in the early days. Uh, hi, I'm Gautam Hazari. Um, I'm the co-founder and CTO for Secura ID. Uh, I'm an AI practitioner. Uh, the first time I used AI was in 1999. At that time, you know, AI was not even AI, and at that time, all these technologies were not even there. And we were using, if any of you are following the technologies, uh, we were using um, something called Prologue and Omnimark, which doesn't even exist right now. Uh, have seen the AI winter, then have seen that AI has come out from the AI winter during 2012 uh, through the AlexNet, then saw whatever you know, is happening with GPT, chat GPT, and now using AI to solve one critical problem of the um, digital space, which I call the identity crisis of the internet. Basically solving all of us, or basically protecting all of us from the frauds. And uh, very happy to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Shall we just say a few words about why now with AI and its history? Hello. 
It seems to me that uh, there are three things that are driving the interest in AI. Uh, the first thing is clearly the amount of data that's being generated, which in turn can actually be used to actually apply AI techniques and technologies. So the amount of data is critical, and that may determine which sectors are going to be successful first or not. The second area which is driving it, I think, is the processing capability. We have far more compute today than we had in the early years of AI or machine learning, and that added compute power means we can process so much more of the data and apply, again, the AI tools. But I think the third point is connectivity, and I was really pleased that you referred to references to the uh, digital divide, because actually connectivity has significantly changed our reach and access to data more so than ever before. So if data is the key ingredient, which sectors are going to be first? I would suggest to you that financial services is an immediate candidate, both for improved processing of money or e-commerce, or perhaps using identity management appropriately without fraud. So financial services is a key sector. I'd secondly suggest that areas like health and particularly life sciences, because they have big data sets, are also a strong second and third sector. Beyond that, clearly we see telecommunications, we also see energy, we also see transport developing big data sets and therefore can use AI with the appropriate data access, with the appropriate computing and with the appropriate communications. Now that's both a business to business opportunity as well as a business to consumer opportunity. It won't necessarily all start all at once, but I think we should take lessons from the leading sectors. Perhaps others would like to comment or disagree. So I agree with what Dr. Mike uh, said, and I just add two points to, uh, uh, I think, uh, collaborate to what he said. Uh, when you look at why AI is relevant today, um, and many of you, I'm sure, represent the corporate world, you know, large language models and AI tech tools will come and go. Um, there's something that's current today that will become obsolete in six months' time because some new shining toy will be on the horizon, right? And that's going to continue. For organizations, whether you're in the corporate world, whether you're the government, or whether you're in any, 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 any other body, there are two very important elements that you own. One is data, as Mike said. The second is the human capital. And I think what is not being paid enough attention to, or rather it's been getting more attention now than it had in the past, was that there are two sides to one coin. There's the AI technology side, which is of course an important element, but there's a human dimension side to it, right? And our proposition has always been that both are equally important. It's very easy for us to get fixated by the technology, right? And that's exactly what's happening today. If you go to any any organization, and you are, try and ask them, you know, what's happening in your organization as far as AI is concerned, they'll talk about large number of training programs going on around Copilot or ChatGPT or whatever other tools they're using. That's great. That's important. It needs to be done. However, there's an equal requirement, I think, of why and how you engage with the technology, which is where the human dimension comes in, right? And in this, in this, um, battle to try and figure out how AI will be deployed and used, if we forget the human dimension, then I think not only will we be, you know, unworthy of using a powerful technology like this, but we'll be, you know, we'll be doing a huge disservice to the ingenuity of mankind and to the capabilities that all of us as individuals bring to the table. And we cannot, and I stress, we cannot afford to get into a situation where we submit ourselves to the power of technology without understanding that there's a power of a human being as well, right? And these two are equally important for us to understand, and that's really why I think the ongoing debates are very important. Do you want to use those two mics? <clears throat> so just to continue, I, I agree with much of what Mike and Sanat have said. The one thing I would add, though, is that AI is not new. AI has been around with different names for a long, long time. The, the research that's been carried on in AI, machine learning, image recognition, has been, coming, has been going on for decades. 
But I think, as Michael alluded to, the thing that's really changed is the ability uh, to use much greater compute power. So when I talk to companies, not just in the UK, not just in India, but right around the world, I see companies that are developing technologies for pretty much every single sector you can imagine. I cannot think of a single sector currently where there is not already an early stage company that is providing technology to address some sort of issue, problem, opportunity in that sector. Now, many of these are very similar. So assistance with decision making, trying to understand the impact of some activity or campaign. But I, I agree very firmly with what Sanat just said about things will come and go. Um, I think that's very true. There is a certain topicality about AI at the moment where everybody is very preoccupied with generative AI. I would really um, encourage you to think about other uses of AI and in particular think about how AI will, it will revolutionize some of those industries that perhaps have not had so much attention. So if we think about manufacturing, for instance, we have been in a, in a, in a time where uh, organizations have been gathering data, have been processing the data after the event and trying to understand where their process went wrong or what they need to do now. I think we are moving very quickly to a, a, a period where we are using AI and the gathering of data through sensors and IoT to be go from knowing what's happening now to be able to predict what's going to happen. So the, the concept of predictive maintenance, but also uh, being able to predict optimization. So how would, should we run our processes differently? And this applies to manufacturing, but it also apl applies to transportation and logistics and many, many other sectors. So I think the, the point to take home is that AI is not just limited to any single sector. It's not just about Gen, I, Gen AI, but it's going to apply to all sectors and much quicker than you think. Um, I want to take a few steps back from the verticals. So let's see where the digital, you know, the digital space is right now, right? The way I see that is um, the digital space has got these three A's. It's apps, it's APIs, and that it's AI. And um, apps, applications we have been using for quite some time, doesn't matter which vertical. But after the iPhone revolution from 2007, it uh, became, you know, proliferating our daily lives, you know, from when we wake up till when we go to bed. Um, and uh, APIs are something which the app started to use, which is not used by we humans. By, but by the machines. Um, I mean, Akamai, who are the edge cloud providers, so they provided the statistics that uh, more than 86% of the entire traffic on the internet actually are for APIs. So we don't see those, but that's what is happening. And the third is AI. Interesting, I mean, APIs are not new as well. In 1974, uh, the first time uh, it, was, it was used in, in, in the current form, uh, AI, as Chris was mentioning, uh, is pretty old, actually the oldest. Uh, if you see uh, whatever is happening in the Gen AI world, for example, uh, through all these neural networks, so neural networks are not neural networks. If you know backpropagation, that's the core of neural networks. Backpropagation is an implementation of chain rule from Leibniz. And that was presented in 1676. So it's the oldest one, right? The first neural network was created in 1958 by Rosenblatt. It was called Perceptron. So it's nothing is new. Something happened in 2012. We may talk about it in probably in another uh, forum. That triggered it. That created the popular perception of AI. But what's happening right now is these three A's are getting converged. And that's a singularity that's happening. And that's the important bit because this singularity is going to impact our, you know, kind of day-to-day -day life. It's going to impact society. It's going to impact everything. And what do I mean by that singularity? Let's start with the um, applications. Why do we need applications? Why do I need to open up Google Map and then say, hey, I want to go to the HCI in London? Because the machines, they don't understand our language. 
we have a language barrier, right? Language connects us, but language is a barrier between machines and humans as well. API is a language that machines understand. A machine consumes the service from another machine through APIs, right? So why this convergence happening right now? So the world has been oscillating between two paradoxes. Polanyi's paradox and Moravec's paradox. Polanyi's paradox says that we know more than what we can express. And Moravec's paradox says that there are tasks which are easy for computers, difficult for humans. For example, you know, a cube root of a 123 digit number. I can't do it. It's very difficult for me. The computer will do it easily. But there are tasks which are easy for humans and difficult for computers. Both the paradoxes were talking about language. Language is something that has been very easy for us, not easy for machines. And language is something that was creating that barrier that we know a lot, but we couldn't express it to the computers. But now, this is where that convergence is happening. Through AI, that barrier is being shattered. These two paradoxes are being shattered. And again, I will mention large language model. I know we talked about that, you know, AI is beyond large language model, but this is significant enough, right? This large language model or whatever happened, I mean, chat GPT is not the first time when this language model started to happen, right? It happened before that as well. So these language models created a mechanism for machines to understand our languages. And then that is creating all this convergence and it's not theory, right? I don't know if you have seen this uh, humane pin, which was announced last year, or the, uh, what's that called, rabbit R1, I received it last week only. I was waiting since, uh, I think, January. So where it's a device, right, and you use natural language to interact. So I ordered Uber the other day, not using the Uber app, just talking to it. You keep it in your pocket, just use language, right? So there are no apps, there are no APIs. So AI is converging all these three. And the implication of that is immense. We will, we will see it, you know, as we, as we go further. That's how I see where, you know, the, let's say, current, why currently AI is relevant and we should talk about it. I agree with that, but I'd like to add another A in, if I may. You know, you've given three A's. I'd like to add in the A of access, because I think access is very important here. Not just human access, but access to the data, access through coverage, if we think that one third of the world's population still do not have full access to the internet, you can see why access is a bit of an issue. Sometimes it relates to language, but sometimes it relates to coverage. Sometimes it relates to access to the developer community. Sometimes it relates to access to the data itself. And if I take a, an example from satellites in space, uh, particularly as they've been mentioned already, we need to think about how can we get the benefits from space for a much broader audience. That requires us to think about access to the data from space so that those big birds in the sky can share the data for many, many more innovation purposes. The number of satellites is going to grow to a huge number. Some say as high as 60,000 within five years. If it's as high as that, how do we get access to that data? So we can see which parts of the land need water, which parts of the land are being eroded, which parts of the land can grow crops, which farmers should be subsidized or not. Some of that access from above is critical from a data point of view. But I would say generally we have to keep that language of access and inclusion in everything we do in this area. So sometimes I talk about AI as access and inclusion. So both of you have been talking about the A's, I'll move to the B, uh, which is banking. And Mike mentioned in his opening comments that financial services is probably one industry which is ripe for uh, you know, discussion here. Uh, so my background in the last 34 years has been in financial services. Um, why is financial services as an industry so ripe for a technology like AI? Uh, a few reasons. One is, of course, outside of the government, it's probably the largest industry, sorry, it's probably the industry with the largest amount of data, right? Some would argue retail or telecom, but certainly, you know, financial services would be very high up there. So that's point number one. Point number two is that it is the most regulated industry in the world today, right? Uh, 
independent of AI or anything else, banking is the most regulated industry in the world today. And therefore, when any new disruptive technology like AI comes in, if you're able to manage and navigate the incorporation and the deployment and hopefully the responsible usage of that in an industry like banking, then I think you cross, as far as all of us as human beings are concerned, you cross a very big hurdle in how you will navigate around the capabilities of that technology. Uh, since the topic is India and the UK, I want to put forth a point here of, you know, something that the two economies might sort of learn from one another. Uh, the UK is home to some of the largest banks in the world. Uh, it's got obviously a fewer number of financial institutions compared to India, but some very, very big ones. Uh, India, on the other hand, skipped, I think, a couple of generations of technology. And if you look at the modernization of the core systems, India is actually ahead of the UK, right? So there is, there is, there is something to be learned from both sides. Um, I'd submit to you that in organizations where they've got their backend in order and they've modernized the backend legacy systems, the ability to use AI and the ability to do everything around AI, whether it's analytics, whether it is uh, how, you, how you translate the capability of AI into offerings that are beneficial for end customers like you and I, that becomes obviously a lot easier. Uh, also, the regulatory environment in the two countries is a little different. The UK regulates AI. India, from what I've read, regulate, what I've read, regulates for AI. Now there's a subtle difference, right? One is regulating AI, the other is regulating for AI. And I think the subtle difference, while there are obviously overlaps and there are commonalities between the two, I think the subtle difference is the recognition that in a large economy like India with 1.4 billion people, and effectively, it's, it's like maybe 30, 40 different countries within one country, right? We are economically and in other forms of demographics, it's a very diverse country. And therefore, you can't have one set of parameters coming in and say, we'll just regulate it in this manner. The way the technology gets used and deployed in such a large economy, from some of the richest to the most poor people, obviously is going to be very different. And the manifestation of the technology is going to be very different. And which is why the approach that's been taken there, saying we want to regulate for AI rather than regulate AI itself. Um, and I'm sure we'll come back to this topic in this discussion. I think that is one area where there is a point of difference between the two countries. But I think there's an opportunity for the two countries to learn from one another, both in terms of the technology maturity, but also in terms of the diversity. And I just want to make one point here. When you look at the UK and Western Europe, the strength of the UK, obviously, is our diversity here, right? And oftentimes, I think we don't recognize that, right? The diversity of a small country like UK is immense. And to that extent, it is in some ways reflective of the diversity that's there in a large and complex country like India. So I think there are, there are points to learn from one another. And there are also areas of difference, like I said, regulating for AI and regulating AI. And maybe there's something for us to learn from that in terms of how the two economies can collaborate. So, um, Sanat, uh, I would like to come back to that regulatory approach because in India it's a techno-regulatory approach. But before that, uh, Chris, maybe it will be useful to understand, you know, the AI landscape in UK because you have been very close to that, right? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so if we think about the AI landscape in the UK, um, we've already said that AI research has been going on for a very long time. But I think there were a few things that happened over the last 10 years which are very significant. Firstly, there was the AI sector deal which was launched in 2018. This was close to £1 billion worth of new investment from the public sector supported by industry to do a number of things. To create a, an even stronger research base, to create 16 centres of doctoral training, PhD, PhD level institutes focused entirely on different aspects of AI to uh, focus very strongly on maintaining and strengthening the skills base. So making sure that people coming through universities would be equipped with the right uh, AI skills that they would need. And also looking at the uptake of AI. Well, since that time, uh, we've seen successive waves of investment in AI from the public sector, again, supported by industry. So for instance, the creation of a NHS AI lab, a similar organization for defense, 
and a, um, an institution known as ARIA, which is the Agency for Research and, and Invention, uh, which advanced research and invention, which is uh, focused on a number of things, but particularly on AI. So all of these elements coming together with a very strong focus on developing the research uh, capability, but also the skills base, have led to a very well-equipped workforce, if you like, for AI. But at the same time, it's important to think about what else is happening uh, in the private sector at the same time. So we have seen for quite a long time the growth of AI-focused uh, tech startups and scale-ups. And uh, the Department for Science, Innovation and Technology last year published a report which said that there are around 3,150 AI companies in the UK, of which about 1,900 were what they call dedicated AI companies. So in other words, companies where the focus has been entirely on AI rather than just the application or the use of AI. So we have uh, seen the creation of a series of accelerators and incubators, so, such as Entrepreneur First here in London, which is a uh, accelerator that focuses on building startups in AI and data science from the ground up. But of course, this capability is spread right across the UK. So we see very good accelerators in AI in other parts of the country. So the University of Edinburgh, for instance, has one of the most successful AI accelerators focused on a number of different themes, including AI for good. So with all of this, plus the very strong venture capital environment in the UK, and I'm, as I'm sure many of you are aware, the UK is the number one destination for VC investment in Europe. Many, many of those VCs have increasingly uh, decided to invest in AI companies, and therefore we see the highest percentage of uh, uh, VC investment going on AI companies in the UK than anywhere else in Europe as well. So putting all of these things together, plus a very strong emphasis on creating the right kind of digital infrastructure in terms of compute power. Uh, so for instance, again, on the public sector side, the creation of Isambard AI, uh, AI which is a uh, supercomputer super focused on AI, which will be in Bristol. All of these elements come to create an environment which is very attractive for research, but it's also very attractive for startup companies to grow and to flourish. And hence, we see some of the greatest innovations in the world taking place in the UK. Now, I think there are others on the panel who can talk more, more ably about India, but I am also very impressed with all of the AI companies that I've seen coming from India as well. And we would like to attract many of these to come and set up a presence in the UK as well. Um, Thanks, Chris. Maybe it's only fair that we, you know, um, lay out what's happening in India as well. Uh, there's a lot happening. I don't think we can cover in uh, the time frame that we have. But on the similar grounds, um, there are right now around 330,000 startups in India. Out of those, 117,000 are being recognized by DPIIT, the, you know, the the industry and internal trade uh, departments. Majority of those are using some form of AI, right? Out of those, there are 116 unicorns. Four of the unicorns are being formed just this year. Actually, the last one happened uh, last month only. They're using AI-based, um, I think they're called Sirinos or Sirion. Uh, they're doing AI-based um, uh, legal document um, uh, processing. The first one was Krutrim. Um, I mean, if you know Ola in India, it's uh, the same company actually started and it's from private sector. Um, that they were the first one as the unicorn. Um, having said that, um, in India, the AI landscape is across all the sectors, public sector, private sector, public private, um, coordination, academic sector, crossing across all, Krutrim we talked about. That's a private sector AI. They are looking into um, multiple areas of AI. We'll talk about that uh, a bit later on what's needed uh, for the AI ecosystem uh, to grow and where coordination can happen between the two countries. Uh, but Krutrim is looking into foundation models. They're looking into creating uh, 
chips as well, and also an AI cloud. Um, they were in the news recently on, you know, they had some uh, interesting discussions uh, with uh, Google as well. Um, on the public sector, I think this is where the most interesting things are happening. Um, language is critical for India because language in the digital space um, is needed for the inclusion. So there are 22 official languages in India and there are 780 languages spoken. Um, it's the second largest number of languages on Earth after Papua New Guinea. So um, for the digital inclusion and as uh, we were talking about and Mr. High Commissioner said as well that the humans are important in there as well, not just the machines and the businesses. For every single individual in India to participate in that digital space in the digital journey, it has to be you know, proliferating in all those uh, languages as well. So for that, there is a sub-ministry called Bhashini uh, from the public sector. Um, it's the Bhasha interface for India. It's part of the mighty uh, industry. And they used a very innovative approach. I think this is something we can start to discuss about doing it here. They started because, you know, uh, as we talked about data and the language corpus, how do you actually create language corpus across 780 languages? Even with the 22 official languages, that becomes a mammoth task. So what Bhashini did was, they used a model called um, Bhasha Dan. Bhasha is language, right? And Dan is you donate it. So it's a crowdsource thing. And then they created four different applications. Suno India, Bolo India, Nikho India, and Deco India. And then anyone can download. And Suno India is, is listen. India, so you listen to some, some you know, words or some sentence, and then you type it back in the language that you speak. So you are donating, you are doing dan of that language, and that's a brilliant approach. And then now it has created a huge amount of you know uh, data and uh, language corpuses just doing crowdsourcing, right? It's a simple approach, uh, and. There are other approaches happening. So this is from the public sector. So there are things happening, for example, uh, AI for Bharat. AI for Bharat is a brilliant initiative initiated by the incubation from uh, IIT Madras, but in conjunction with the Bhashini uh, industry as well, where they started to create um, the multiple, let's say, data sets. And again, they used a very innovative approach, right? How do you collect data is critical. So what they did was, because in India, there are um, you know, radio stations in different languages. So what they did was, they started uh, a machine or a model to listen to all these radio stations in different languages. That's how they collected and trained um, the data, free of cost, right? So um, that's something that's happening there. And also there is a, there is a uh, um, it's called Bharat GPT, I guess, from Cover AI, which is um, initiated. I think it's funded by Reliance, but all the nine IITs are involved as well. And then what they're doing is they're creating um, what they call vertical uh, language models. So, and again, these are some of the things. There are a lot many other things going on as well, just to, you know, um, say what's going on in India. And um, then we can talk about how, you know, the two countries can start to talk about that. I think the respiratory... Yes. Uh, and I work in sustainability and financial transformations. Uh, question to forum and uh, to respected High Commission as well. Uh, the, Given that uh, there are a lot of synergies in these two countries, I mean, the complementary capabilities uh, are there. So, uh, the, and given that this is an evolving space and uh, a free trade agreement on the cards soon, what is there, uh, are you guys aware of uh, some policies, guidance, or some space where uh, AI or other tech, uh, per se, uh, is going to be promoted between these two countries? Like, uh, what, what this, uh, you know, entrepreneurs in this room should be aware of and should be preparing for when, when this, uh, in the next few months, years? Um, I'll take a stab at it and I'll give you 
one perspective, probably not the full perspective. Uh, I think Chris mentioned that the UK is the most mature market in terms of venture capital support for startups. Uh, I think if there's one area that India can learn a lot from the UK, it is actually in creating an ecosystem to allow all these brilliant ideas to flourish more. And I'll just elaborate on what I'm saying. Uh, there's no shortage of ideas in India. There's no shortage of money in India. What is the problem is that it's not channelized in an efficient manner. Uh, last week I was in Dubai, and for our newly uh, set up uh, AI advisory, we are looking at opening either at DIFC in Dubai or the Abu Dhabi global markets in Abu Dhabi. And many of you will be aware, between Dubai and Abu Dhabi, there's a healthy competition. When you go and see the technology environment there and the ecosystem that they've created for helping startups not just get started, but eventually how they get supported, India is light years behind. And with all the money, with all the ideas, and with all the good work that's happened on the technology side in India, if we can learn from economies like the UK of how we can make it easy for entrepreneurs and fintechs and startups to flourish in India, it can be a huge boon. Because mind you, the biggest asset for a startup there is the massive domestic market. Right? That is one reason alone why these, these, these startups should flourish. And I have many, since I come from the tech industry, I have many, many former colleagues and friends who have spent time in industry and who have today launched into entrepreneurial ventures, and it is frustrating for them. Right? Uh, even in terms of making capital available, like Chris mentioned, you know, I'm not just talking of a dragon, dragon's den kind of a forum. There's no shortage of number of people in India who have the money, who have the experience, and who have, want to contribute. It's just that it's happening on a very ad hoc basis. And I wonder whether through the UK and the, the, the more mature system that we have here in the UK, whether there is a way for us to channelize that through official channels and to create an ecosystem within the country in India uh, for these, for, these, for these startups to flourish. And mind you, if they do start flourishing, um, it's only a matter of time before many of them start looking at markets outside of India. Right? And obviously the UK, given the traditional closeness between the two countries and given the fact that it's an English-speaking economy and therefore a lot easier for Indian entrepreneurs to do business with than a country like China, for example, where there are obvious barriers because of the language and culture, there can be a lot of flourishing of you know, ideas and trade there. So I think some thought towards learning from the UK and, like I said, you know, what Dubai and Abu Dhabi are doing in terms of creating an ecosystem, making it easier for entrepreneurs to flourish, making it easier for them to actually leverage a one stop shop, right? And it's not a Namke Vaste thing. In Dubai, it's actually a one stop shop. We did the meetings at 11 o'clock. By 2 o'clock, my entity was registered, right? And when I say registered, all the follow-up things, which is opening a bank account, having all the support infrastructure that's required for you as an entrepreneur, even though you are resident in the UK, was all in place. And you know, uh, I, 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 I think the ecosystem for the startups, there's, there's a lot that India can learn from the UK, and maybe there's something that we can impart through these official channels to, to create the setup in, in, in India. Uh, if I can just add, I'll disagree uh, slightly in their um, summit. So yes, things need to improve. So for example, just in H1 this year, the amount of funding that has happened with the startups is um, over several billion USD. Uh, last year in H1, it was 5.2 billion. So things are happening uh, there. At the same time, if you see in the unicorn list, right? So India has got the third largest unicorns out there. So things are happening. I agree things can improve, really, you know, uh, doing business there. But on the other hand, what I want to touch upon, Piyush, as you asked, is there are things, and as it happens, right, in a kind of, um, in a transactional way, there are things that um, in UK we can learn from India. And this is where I want to um, come back to your regulatory point, right? So um, here we have, as you said, um, regulate 
for AI or regulate AI, right? So in India, they used an interesting approach on regulation. It's techno regulation. What does that mean is not just creating a regulation. So here in Europe, I'm, I'm including UK, yeah, in, in Europe uh, from that perspective. So for example, PSD2 regulation is there, right, for banking and then open banking came up. So that's a regulation. How do you implement it? You leave it to the banks and then, you know, in, in independent forums. There's a regulation for identity, it's called EIDAS. Uh, again, how do you implement it? You leave it to someone else. There's GDPR there. How do you implement GDPR? You leave it to someone else. Not a bad approach, but the approach that is used in India is different. It's not just creating that regulation, creating the infrastructure, technology infrastructure around that as well. Not just creating a banking regulation, but creating the UPI stack as part of DPI. Not just creating an identity regulation, but creating UIDAI and creating the Aadhaar stack as part of the same DPI. And also going beyond that. For example, the DPDP Act, which is hopefully will be coming very soon, uh, is equivalent to GDPR, but it's not just a regulation. There is a technical platform called DEPA, which will be exposing how to take consent as well, right? So that's something that we can learn here. If India can do it at India scale with 1.4 billion population, definitely we can you know, learn and do it uh, here in a similar way as well. So uh, moving not just into regulatory, let's say, uh, definitions, but going one step uh, beyond that and creating the technology on top of that regulation. That's something that we can learn here. So I agree, but I'd like to say that I think we can learn a lot from each other. And the stunning progress that's been made in India around identity management and e-commerce needs to be understood better in the UK. If we don't understand that, we can't progress in some areas that relate to AI. We can't offer help or support. So we need to raise understanding in that identity management area. I've also got plans with the support of Innovate UK to do a mission to the India Mobile Congress in the third week in October. I've done 30 years in mobile. I've been going to India since 1989 because of mobile telecommunications. I am sure we're going to learn a lot from India Mobile Congress by just looking to see what is happening there in New Delhi uh, for that particular event. But I'd like to go on to six potential areas for collaboration, assuming the learning works well. It seems to me that we could learn from the research side of each other. Some of the universities in India are, are world class. Some of the universities in the UK are world class. Some of the AI output from those universities could be better shared than it is today. We have on the research level a UK-India Future Networks initiative. That could be, with the right permission, extends to AI, particularly in networks. We could logically think about that sort of approach for AI more broadly if there was a wish to do that. So I think there's a research collaboration zone which could be university to university if structured in the right way. I think there's an innovation exchange which I would strongly encourage. You know, we have huge numbers of accelerators and incubators in the UK. You said you have accelerators and incubators in India. I think getting some of the leading accelerators and incubators to work with each other directly is, is overdue. And I don't see why we're not doing that now. Now, we need to work out the focus and the mechanism, but with an AI focus, I think there would be an appetite for that. I think the support mechanisms from our respective governments, whether it be the innovation agency in the UK, Innovate UK, or the equivalent in India, getting them to work together around an AI focus, I think, would help that. But I would start with the incubators and accelerators from exchange. I think the skills mechanisms we haven't really talked enough about. You've referred to the human capital, but actually, if we don't exchange students who are studying AI with each other, we're missing a trick, aren't we? How are we going to get the skills for the future of AI that are global citizens that can actually take the best ideas from each other's countries? So I would think AI cooperation around skills would be a logical uh, subject area. I do not wish to leave my sector point, though. If the early sectors that have interest in AI and big data sets are in financial services, why aren't we encouraging the key players in financial services in the UK and financial services in India to work together? 
do it on a sector by sector basis. Choose two or three sectors, but maybe financial services or a second one to start with. Sector collaboration. I'd lastly like to just suggest that we need to measure this. So we need a kind of framework that can measure progress in this area. We could add other ideas, but doing too many ideas will just not get us anywhere. So to me, I've listed the collaboration areas I would consider. Maybe a few others could be added, but let's agree what the framework is for that to make it happen. Okay, I think we have some questions. Hi, everyone. So my name is Narinda Patti, um, and I'm representing Google um, UK FinTech team. Um, so first of all, uh, Dr. Mike Short, um, totally agree on all of your points that you've just uh, uh, explained there. So I was recently at Nottingham University with Dr. Miriam Deegan and um, they're doing a lot of collaboration uh, with some of the tech providers to help accelerate um, some uh, the new startups with the accelerators, incubation, innovation, etc. So we see that happening um, across the UK quite a lot. So again, to your point, you know, that's something I think India could learn from if that if they're not doing that already, and perhaps, you know, um, exchanging ideas, etc., from each other. From a service provider um, perspective, I'd like to say Google certainly does uh, provide funding. Uh, for startups and we do that in a number of ways so that's another way um, that's available in India as well to the startups the global program perhaps that could be utilized in a better way uh, to accelerate up and make the startups um, more successful uh, and then um, Sanat Rao, you said some really great things about regulated space and regulating for AI uh, versus regulating in AI. UK is currently unregulated in the AI space. In the EU, we have seen a recent regulation. Um, what we've also seen, certainly in fintech, uh, which is a new kind of like innovation arm, and we've seen the more traditional institutions like HSBC and NatWest, they are starting the innovation departments. Um, we're seeing the uptake of AI slow in the back office. So employee productivity gains, customer experience um, improvements, etc. What do you see in India in the front office where the UK can learn from and how can we collaborate together between UK and um, India? And my third point is around Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Definitely see the competition there. Recently at an event there, they've publicly um, published and said they want to be, make that the world's largest innovation hub. So we want to keep our companies here. We want to see India innovate and the collaboration. So what can we do to keep our startups successful here? Yeah. I think I'll answer the second one. The second one was, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily have an answer to that, but I'll, I'll put forth a perspective which I think many of you will relate to. Uh, and I go back to the point I made earlier about the banking industry being the most regulated industry. Uh, the way I see AI coming into the industry is that it's part of a continuum. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, digital technology came in, and every organization said, we want to be digital first, right? And I dare say that the banking industry was not making great progress there, and it, had it not been for COVID, we wouldn't have discovered that there's a completely different way of doing banking, right? COVID actually facilitated that. It was not because there were some great ideas within the industry. So digital came about. Before banking industry could monetize the capability of digital transformation, there was a move towards cloud, right? And cloud, by nature of the technology, obviously, there's a much heavier impact of regulation of local jurisdiction, where the data resides, and so on. Banks have not yet moved to, to the cloud when AI came in, right? Within AI, then there was Gen AI. And in two years' time, or maybe even shorter, there'll be something else that'll come in. 
The point I'm making is that in the banking industry, despite being the most regulated industry, there's pressure on the banks to be always in the most current form of technology. And my submission is that in both India and in the UK, there's a lot to be learned about the digital transformation before you plunge head on into AI itself, right? Don't see AI as a completely different technology. I like to see that as a, as a, as a step in the continuum. And like I said, there'll be something else that'll come in the next one or two years. Who knows, quantum computing, there's something else. But, you know, not too long ago, people were talking about blockchain. So there'll be, there'll be new ideas that'll come and they'll die. And there'll be other new ideas that'll suddenly, you know, promise a lot more. So I think within the banking industry, both in India and UK, going back to the point I made earlier about the fact that in India, banks have actually crossed that big hurdle of legacy transformation and they've modernized their backend systems. If we look at AI as a step in that continuum, there's a lot that can be done and achieved in terms of facilitating that. Now, like Mike said, what is the form of collaboration and learning and in what channels you sort of do that? It's a vast canvas, right? And we, we, we obviously need to sort of look at maybe two or three ideas. But I'd stick to the point that we made earlier, that leveraging data, and fact that data by itself can be the biggest differentiator for an institution, because that's the, you know, LLMs will come and go, but data will reside with you, right? That's your biggest asset. I'd say there's a lot to be done around that. Uh, there's just one other point, and I'll hand it back here. When I talk about data, I think something else we should discuss is, The two countries are very different in terms of the way data is treated. Take something like privacy. The notion of privacy in the UK and in many parts of the West is very, very different from the notions of privacy in India. Right? Regulation will not allow you to deal with data in the most efficient manner. Regulation is a tool and it's allow, you know, regulation is there to ensure that people sort of stay on the right side of law. But there are socio-cultural factors that come into play here. And I think there's, there's something that we can do, and I'm going to not dominate the discussion and hand it to the other speakers, but there's something to be said in terms of what we can learn from one another around the, around the fact that beyond regulation, there's a lot to be done, learn from the, from the, from the people itself. So you, you briefly mentioned Miriam Deegan, who I know. I last met her when we went on a mission to Ethiopia, and that was sponsored by the Royal Academy of Engineering. The lesson I would take from that is we could do something between the Royal Academy of Engineering of the UK and an equivalent engineering academy in India. And I'm sure she would be a great player on that sort of thing, but alongside other professors. We need to have a critical mass to make it work on both sides. But I respect your, your nomination of her as a candidate. My comments are very quick. Um, to try and address the other two points that you raised. Firstly, there is a program called, um, uh, what was it called? Build, I Build AI, um, which is Bridge AI. Thanks, Mike. Just momentary lapse there. I need some AI to help me this time of day. Um, Bridge AI is a program uh, run by Innovate UK, which is focusing on a s several different sectors where AI has been a little bit slower on the uptake. And uh, the sectors are uh, agriculture, creative, construction, uh, and transport and logistics, which I think resonate very well between the two, two countries. So I think there are opportunities to use that kind of program and perhaps to extend it out to think about relationships between India and the UK. The second point, which was about uh, UAE and uh, how do we retain startups and scale-ups here and, and in India, I think there is a natural synergy between the UK and India in the following respect. The UK has been a, a center of, of creating startups for a long time. There's a lot of experience in serial entrepreneurship. There's a lot of funding. There's a lot of experience. Those companies do struggle to scale. And I think the obvious market for them to scale in is India, just because of the number of people and the number of opportunities equally well for those huge number of, of Indian startups to come to the UK and get some experience in this very, very international environment that we have here in the UK and to help them to look at opportunities across not just the UK, but across the rest of the European region and further afield, which many would say is perhaps a little easier to do from here. So two suggestions for your two points. Can I go? 
Hello. Yeah, uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, my name is Satish Krishnamurthy. I'm a professor and the director of uh, UK National Land Beam Center in University of Surrey, and uh, we are also one of the CDTs for people-centered AI. And uh, uh, short, I think you were mentioning about uh, Royal Academy of Engineering. Currently, I hold the Royal Academy of TSP grant with India on AI influences of uh, energy, particularly on solar energy. So that is with Parul University in Gujarat. So there is initiatives happening through TSP sectors. And we also have some innovative AI grants. So one of the things which there are a couple of questions I have, but I will ask, keep it very short with two of those. Um, one is like as... Uh, High Commissioner was mentioning, what is the one critical thing we need to leapfrog in AI? So my suggestion in two sectors, because I always feel that uh, more AI is pushing, we are losing the manufacturing sectors, so the skills in the manufacturing or mechanical engineering, other skills are going on because AI is lucrative, it's easy. The mobile is accessible to everyone and then they can learn things very quickly. But there is other engineering jobs which we really keen to develop that is going on. So how do we create this imbalance? That is one thing. The second thing is what one specific sector we can leapfrog in the AIs, using AI. It could be healthcare, it could be manufacturing industries. Particularly data is to me is wealth. If you are selling data, you are selling your wealth. Thank you. Human intervention always has a role to play, isn't it? Thank you. Uh, my name is Bhushan Patel. I'm from Prodapt. I think uh, Sanat did mention, refer to this point. Technologies, including AI, has this great unifying nature that no matter which part of the world they work, they work the same way. But when we talk about taking technology like AI into governance and social services and sectors, culture and uh, you know ethics will play a very important role. Do you think there is there is an approach available between, let's say, our two countries, or globally how it is being dealt with? I can start and then, you know, please uh, chip in. So, of course, there are variations in from culturally, and I think the biggest variation is language, 780 versus one, right? That gives an opportunity to, um, really learn from each other. And one of the critical thing that we need to really look into, uh, I'll just take a step back, right? I think that way, um, you know, you said one, what is that one sector that we can actually look into? Uh, what I see is in, let's say for an AI, because AI is an ecosystem, it's not just one thing, right? You cannot just learn one thing. And that's the framework that you are talking about. Sorry, I'm jumping from A, B to M directly, right? So there are five M's I see, right? So, and they're all obvious ones. Model, multimodal data, microchips, mathematics, and what I call mindful AI. So, and it doesn't matter which country, and mindful AI basically is humanization of AI, responsible AI, regulation, whether it is regulation or techno regulation, doesn't matter, right? That should create or give um, some framework for cooperation, right? And you know, which, let's say, um, sector or where we start to cooperate with the variations, it's tricky, but we can pick, right? Um, for example, one of the things um, we were talking about earlier is, for example, commerce, e-commerce, right? So, um, worldwide, 43% of the entire e-commerce is owned by four companies, all American. In India, 63% of all e-commerce is owned by two companies, American, right? E-commerce, and the reason I'm saying that is, this is where AI can play a role in all the five M's, right? What does that mean is, e-commerce needs to be democratized. What does that mean is, for example, let's take an example. You start your journey, you want a pair of shoes, you go to a particular e-commerce provider, doesn't matter which country, 
here uh, the same company exists in both places, right? You go UK or in India, the experience is exactly same. You don't start with a pair of shoes. You start with the platform. You will pick the platform, then browse through the pair of shoes, select whichever you want, and then it will only be delivered by whatever the platform is providing, right? So you don't really start from what you want, you start from the platform, and that experience sits between both, right? And this is the reason that, you know, it's not really democratized. So one thing that has happened in India, it's called, it's part of the DPI stack, it's called ONDC. One Network for Digital Commerce. So from a platform-centric way, you break that into a network, right? And use AI and models to basically, you know, for example, if a very small, um, and I'm jumping from shoes to, for example, vegetables, right? Or someone is creating shoes by hand. If they need to sell it in this, let's say, e-commerce space, doesn't matter which country, right? What they will face is the barrier, how do I actually create the catalog entry? So now actually Google is helping. So Google has created a model there where you just take a picture of that whatever shoes or whatever you're making and it creates the entry into whatever network catalog you want in whatever language you want, right? That is something that we can learn here. That is something that we can, I'm not saying that's the only thing that we can start with. That is something that we can learn here is democratizing e-commerce. And then that is, the reason I'm saying that is that is beyond culture. We are having the exact same experience in this country and also in India. Uh, hi, um, my name is Satyam Surana and I'm a lawyer by profession. I'm currently pursuing my LLM in the London School of Economics and I'm working around how AI and law can be interconnected. So we've had a lot of discussion around how companies or f fintech companies or other sectors are uh, affected or helped by AI. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, what exactly how do you see the future of AI in law because we are having talks of using AI in uh, the legal sector not particularly from the point of view of the lawyers or the solicitor's office but from the point of view of the judicial system that is the justice delivery system as a part of trials or uh, issues like that. So in India at least we use AI just for the sake of investigation for assisting the machinery maybe recreation of the crime scenes but it is still not accepted as evidence in court and at the same time we are having talks about replacement of AI inside the court as a part of the uh, justice delivery system. So what would be your uh, vision for the future of AI in the courtroom uh, and uh, if at all it has any future what would be the, its vulnerability? Um, or what can be the issues around it? So I think it's very interesting to look at the legal sector. Um, I think a study that I saw maybe five years ago said that 45% of all law firms in the UK were already using some form of AI then. It is one of the leading sectors. I think in terms of um, thinking about the different scenarios, of course, we have to think about the danger of hallucinations in, in the legal space. So gathering lots of data together, evidence, and then saying, well, actually it didn't really happen like that at all because the AI has made something up. So the ethical dimension of, of the application in the legal space is really, really paramount. However, there is a lot of activity. I have spoken to, I don't know, half a dozen uh, legal tech firms using AI or developing AI over the last year or so. And um, if you want to find out more information about what's going on in, in uh, technology in AI for legal, it's an organization called Legal Geek uh, based in the UK. Uh, they run events and I'm sure you'd find that quite interesting, but happy to have a one-to-one -one discussion afterwards if that's helpful. Uh, Satyam, uh, just to add one bit, uh, I thought maybe you would be aware of it. Uh, Europe, uh, of our colleagues in the panel, they spoke about access. And what Supreme Court is doing uh, in terms of using AI is simultaneously, you know, uh, uh, translating all the judgments in all the regional languages. So uh, that again is a great example of how to use AI. Uh, and of course, there are so many other things. Uh, of course, there is no end to learning, uh, but we should also know what's happening. Thank you. 
I just want to very quickly add on that as well is probably court room is, uh, you know, um, is the crawl, walk, run process, right? It's the running process. Maybe we can start somewhere. So for example, in the corporate world, um, the day-to-day -day life um, it becomes very busy in um, contract exchange and legal redlining, right? That's already happening right now. That's the crawl phase. That's happening and that's reducing the amount of uh, effort needed in there. So contracts getting exchanged very, very quickly. And there's a large number of startups who are actually doing that. The fourth unicorn which in India that I mentioned, I forgot their name actually, it starts with S, I think Siri knows or Siri on. They're doing exactly that. So that's where it's starting. Courtroom, it will happen, but we'll probably have to wait. Okay, is it better now? Yeah. Hi, I'm Puneet. Uh, I, I work at Oxford University and uh, I've been working in AI for last uh, eight, nine years with my PhD students developing models and all. So I don't have a question. I might have a question. I have a broader comment to make and that might lead to question. I don't know that yet, but I was just thinking about the AI landscapes in the UK and India. So one of the fundamental difference that I see is the UK landscape is very much innovation based. It's driven by innovation. And I still see India as a consumer of AI. We, do, we have hundreds of startups, I know, in India, but I have been talking to the founders, to the VCs. I feel like it's more about someone else is building the model, let's download it, and then try to use it. I think this is a very big problem because the problems that are in India, like if you, if you really want to solve the problems in India using AI, then we have to build something like, say, DeepMind in India for AI, uh, for, for India. And uh, to do that, we have to actually focus on the innovation side of it. Are we doing that? I really doubt. Do we have the appetite? I don't think so because any founder or any VC I have talked to, the first question is, how are we going to get 5 million ARR or something? Like, oh, you don't talk about ARRs if you really want to be innovative. If you want to be futuristic, let's be futuristic because we don't know what future has for us, right? So I think we have to actually uh, promote more innovative startups in India. India. Otherwise, we are trying to just follow someone else's landscape and matching our landscape with them, which I think is, again, like missing the software boom, right? There is Microsoft, there is Google, not in India. I feel like we are following the same path. I might be wrong, but uh, this is what my impression so far about the landscape in AI in India is. And I think this is very important to be taken care of now because if you think about AI, fundamentally there are three aspects, right? There is model, which requires you to know, understand maths. There is data and there is optimizer. So let's forget about optimizer, it's been a solved problem. So what you throw to a model is what the model learns, right? But if I throw Indian data to the model, the model is more likely go to uh, learn some emerging properties from the data about some Indian problems. But if I want to fix the problem, I need to know the model. If I'm not being innovative, if I don't understand what the model is, there's no hope. So I think we have to strive towards being innovative rather than just being a consumer of AI. And I don't know what your thoughts are about like how to do that, like how to enable it. Because lots of people have, like the brain drain is still happening, so there are so many opportunities in India. And most of the top AI companies, if you see, the world, a lot of leadership positions are being held by Indian origin people. So there are, but a lot couldn't leave. So there still are people in India who can build those innovative companies, but we are not actually facilitating, we are not actually helping them to do that. So what are the steps one should be taking? Like as a country, if we really want to build such technology, what do we do? And if we miss this, because as we have already discussed, like two years in AI is not two years, right? It's a different planet. The is fast is progressing so fast that we really have to act now and with much more appetite the government should do something like we should have like I don't know AI ministry I don't know something like that or something very focused towards it otherwise I feel like we'll again be many years behind though we have tons of startups unicorns I don't believe in them because they are unicorn today but we know what's happening with the unicorns like we have so many failed unicorns also so these numbers we know are inflated in many ways so I don't think we should be happy about having 100 unicorns. That's just, I think, a very uh, wrong way of seeing progress. 
progress is to be seen like as a fundamentally what are we doing and i think there is a very uh, urgent need to act on this otherwise we'll again miss the train so that's that's what i wanted to say <laughs> I don't know if you have time or not, so completely agree, right? So, um, you know, fun, the foundation models um, in the AI space are critical, right? That's where we need to uh, look into, and that's what is happening, because otherwise, just jumping into some details, I'm sure you are aware. For example, if you use a foundation model trained in English, right? And if you try to use it in Hindi, the number of tokens is eight times. If you do it in Telugu, it's 16 times, right? That cost to the end user. That is not acceptable, right? So you need to create foundation model in the Indian perspective. That, exactly. And that's happening. Is it happening enough? Maybe not, right? And um, that's where probably the focus needs to be and the mighty um, uh, Ministry of Electronic and IT Industry, they're creating. So one of the ministry is Bhashini. They're doing exactly that. So that's the, la probably that's the first ministry in the world on large language model. I may be wrong, but I have not seen anyone uh, doing that yet, right? But is this enough? Maybe not. But it's the step in the right direction. That's what, that's what I would say. Hello. Hello, my name is Kunal, and I work for Government of UK in Department of Work and Pension. So uh, my question really was based on data ethics, uh, but I do find that uh, when we are talking about uh, India and UK's partnership, digital literacy plays an important role when we deploy this AI into the normal public or general public, and which leads also to the ethics of AI. For an example, if bank is using some banking system is using AI, and if customers ask a question that why this is the outcome, then bank or the person officiated that should know. So that how digital literacy we can learn, because there is a huge gap between both the countries in digital literacy. And uh, second question was actually, to Tech Tuesday UK uh, that what's next after this discussion because after this discussion everyone will have a drink couple of and then go back to home sleep and next tomorrow good morning so that's not, that's as a young generation I don't want to see that because after two years I'm currently working for uh, Department of Work and Pension and as an Indian middle class Indian I do have an aspirations to fill the gap which India also has as an Indian and if we are going to do, do nothing about it tomorrow, that won't be useful. So that's the good two question. Thank you. Um, I'll answer the first part, Subhash. Yeah, take Tuesday, I'm sure you have a, a great plans um, to take this forward. Um, the digital literacy, you're absolutely right, right? And this is exactly where language becomes a barrier in India. Right, majority of the let's say digital space is English only, and in India, 22 official languages, 780. I don't need to repeat that again, right? So that's exactly why this ministry was created to break that. So in G20 uh, last year, if you have seen, uh, Bhashini actually used those let's say the homegrown language models to translate in you know in real time, and those models were homegrown. And again, coming to that innovation thing, right? They were not copied from somewhere else and then, and then that will help to uh, probably push through the digital literacy because otherwise only 15% of um, Indian population understand a bit of English, right? So in that case, if the entire digital space is only English in India, you cannot go beyond that 15%. So you have to break that language barrier and um, that's what has started. Of course, the journey is long. Yeah. Gautam, I think we should thank Tech Tuesday for bringing us together, not just tonight, but actually to help with literacy, the point that's just been raised in a question. Us having these discussions within Tech Tuesday helps us to understand each other and to find a basis for collaboration internationally where it's needed. We don't just discuss AI, but we discuss other subjects where literacy is needed. So I think we should thank Subhash and Tech Tuesday for bringing us together. Wow, what an amazing discussion it was. Um, as usual, I feel very bad 
to be the interrupter of the all exciting interactions that have been going on here. But um, we have reached the formal end of the panel itself. A big round of applause to the panelists. And also, the audience has been very engaging. Uh, so a big round of applause to yourselves as well. Um, so we talked a lot about AI and how the human part of the aspect of AI is important as well. And um, something that I always feel that AI, perhaps at least in my lifetime, wouldn't be able to do is to create beautiful handicrafts. I have a point, I'll tell you why I'm talking about these. May I please request our um, Deputy High Commissioner and Minister Eco to join the panelists for a photo or, and also to felicitate them with the token of our affection, a nice handicraft gift from India, courtesy of GI Heritage, Vineet and Nishi. Uh, please, so these are the wonderful people who have created this handicrafted gift from India, got it here. Uh, may I please request Merman, sir, to please join the guests, uh, the panelists for a photo and also to felicitate them with the handcuffs. May I also request Subhash and Nitin to join the photo as well? Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. May I invite Subhash to finally conclude the event by offering the vote of thanks. Thank you, Shrenjani. Well, uh, uh, a great session, to say the least. Um, thanks, to e thanks to each one of you for coming over. Thanks to the wonderful audience, uh, an amazing panel. And of course, thanks to the High Commission of India for hosting us, for partnering with Tech Tuesdays and giving us this opportunity. Uh, a special thanks, of course, uh, to, to the High Commissioner and to the Deputy High Commissioner, to the members of the staff. In addition to that, I would like to extend a special thanks to a person who has been at the loggerhead of my phone calls and emails. Sri Ranjini, this one's for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, just to continue the discussion, um, uh, we have a standard process of taking a few bites of your thoughts, of your experience of attending Tech Tuesdays today. So please hang around. The volunteers out here will sort of coordinate with you and sort of guide you how it's to be done. Kindly put on your name badges so it's, it's easy for us to identify you. There's a question for someone asked, what's next on Tech Tuesdays? So here it is. We organize on the first Tuesday of every month. Next episode of Tech Tuesdays is happening on the 6th of August. The topic is digital win. Uh, this is going to take place at the Royal College of Radiologists. And just to give a little more context on Tech Tuesdays, as for this particular episode is concerned, uh, we're going to summarize the highlights of discussion, specifically address the action points which the panel and the audience have shared, compile the approach note and share it with the High Commission so that we can take the discussion forward. So yes, we are not going to end this episode virtually over drinks. This is going to continue. Um, I get that's all from my side, and uh, thanks once again. Enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Subhash. Thank you for coordinating so well with us. I am sorry for troubling you with phone calls and emails, but that's how life is. Um, of course, we shouldn't just end discussions with, um, you know, some snacks and drinks, but we can always have still some snacks and drinks. That's not a bad thing to do. So may I please invite you all to join us in the other room for some Indian snacks.
Thank you.